things theology, all things theology. We chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta give doxology to God hollow because this is how we do it at all things theology. Yo, grace and peace. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Theology. I'm your host, K-Dub, and today I want to talk about Howard John Wesley. Before we get to Howard John Wesley, I want to take this moment to let you know to like this video right now, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed, click the notification bell for future episodes, and leave a comment, email if you have any questions. All right, guys, we're going to be talking about Howard John Wesley today. Some of you may not know who Howard John Wesley is. I have had interactions uh, or I've done previous videos about Howard John Wesley, uh, his denial of things like God knowing the future. He's an open theist. He denies that Jesus is the only way or claims that there's possible other ways that he's just not certain about and other things like that. Um, even at one time, I had a phone call conversation. He's a pastor, by the way, in Virginia. I believe that's where the church is. Alfred Baptist Church, Alfred Street Baptist Church. And I was going to have a conversation with him, um, but it ended up not working out. Spoke to his secretary. It seemed like things were going to go well, that I was going to go pay my own money, fly, fly, and which was no issue to me. Fly to Virginia, uh, put up my own hotel, uh, all that, and have a conversation with him just on a panel. And it ended up not, they didn't think that was the best thing to do. Um, at first there was interest, but for whatever reason, um, they did not want to do that. Nevertheless, um, uh, Howard John Wesley, Pastor Wesley has a series where he calls, can you, can I, can you push it? And in this, the series, it's really just kind of like that. Can you push it? Um, kind of like stretching the envelope, introducing people to things they maybe never heard of, but also really introducing people to things he believes in and you'll see kind of once you if, if you if you choose to watch uh, episodes I've done you'll see kind of what more of that is and he'll explain can you push it as well and so you guys know how I like to do it let's get into it and we will talk about this previous uh, can you push it series he's doing further let's go I want to take just a moment to kind of remind ourselves what can I push it is all about there may be some of you who are joining us for the very first time and maybe someone who just doesn't remember. So I want to take just a moment to explain what can I push it is. Oh, and just for fair use, um, I I do chop up the video, never taking anything out of context. I just want people to know so they do not. Um, um, yeah, so they don't, you know, think I'm misusing his words or anything like that. I would never do that. I have a long history of doing things like this where I fairly and accurately uh, represent people. And so, um, yeah, I just want to throw that out there. So let's go ahead. Can I Push It is a different kind of Bible study. If you're used to Bible study where we open up the scriptures and we walk through different passages, that's one way of studying the Bible. But Can I Push It's a little bit different. The goal of Can I Push It is not simply to explore scripture, but to explore Christian living. And so he kind of and we've dealt with this before, but he kind of thinks you could have Bible study without the Bible, which kind of really goes to his uh, sense of revelation of how he knows things. He, he doesn't mind saying, hey, it's experience based and these other other sources outside of Scripture. And so there's really a kind of fundamental issue right there that you that you even think you could do Bible study without a Bible. It's like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like studying a law without uh, the law. You know, it's kind of. It kind of Bible study kind of assumes you're using the Bible. And so there is kind of some interesting uh, things there. We'll, we'll get to further critique of uh, Howard John, but let's let's continue with this. To explore those areas that are controversial, divisive, that cause us to think in different ways, to explore those hotbed issues within the body of Christ. So in some of our previous Can I Push It's, we've dealt with scripture and sexuality. We've dealt with the role and the authority of women in Bible and in the body of Christ. We've taken some time to look at the different perspectives of salvation with the inclusion and the exclusion and the universal and the plural. I invite you to go back and look at 
some of those former Can I Push It? Yes, please do. And I would encourage you also to uh, look at my critique as well if you go watch those episodes because he's an inclusivist. He's, he is not an exclusivist. He doesn't believe Jesus is the only way. And his reason isn't really biblical. I mean, he kind of admits that the Bible teaches exclusion uh, from a from biblical perspective. But he's not coming from it's an experience base. He's met nice, you know, non-Christians. And so have I, you know, so I wouldn't disagree. But the Bible is my standard, not my experience or feelings. And so, yes, I do encourage you if you're watching this video uh, after you get done with this to watch past videos. I have a playlist and I'll try to add this. Remember to add this one to it of material I've covered from Howard John Wesley. I've, I've had a lot of people who've known about him and or, and have attended his church who were, were very thankful that I've made these videos. And I, I am aware that many people who are still attend the church have watched my videos on him and it's made its way around the church. So I am thankful for that. And hopefully this does as well. And just want to remind you that, that there's an intentional goal here. That within Can I Push It, my desire is to follow the Spirit in leading us into some of those divisive and differentiating issues within the body of Christ where we stand on different pages, where we see that people think differently, that not everyone believes the same thing I believe or that you believe. Then we really do explore those areas where there is difference and even division within the body of Christ. So the goal here is not only just to make us think, but also to make us more tolerant. I think one of the most damaging things in the body of Christ is the fact that we can't accept the logic and validity of another point of view. And it, like I said, he's, he's made this argument before, like, um, you know, even if you disagree, you need to accept one's, uh, even the person you're disagreeing with, their logic and, you know, not just understand how they got there, but, you need to say, OK, that's logical. I, I, I accept that as logical in one perspective. I just disagree and more lean over here. Um, no, one does not have to accept one's logic and how they got to a position. You can understand. I, I understand why you believe what you believe and and, you know, the, how those things work. But I don't accept the logic behind it, mainly primarily because it contradicts scripture. And so scripture is my starting point. Um, and like I said, I think these conversations will go better. Like I, I still open the challenge and the door to Howard John Wesley, uh, you know, that I can come and we can have a can I push it dialogue series, <laughs> uh, something uh, to that nature. Um, and I, I do see that he is injured. So I, I do hope the best in his recovery it looks like a shoulder injury. Um, I've injured my shoulder, too. So I, I know how bad it is. So, hey, uh, Howard John Wesley, uh, if you hear this, I am praying for you in your injury. And I do hope the best in your recovery of that. But uh, back on topic, one does not have to validate one's logic. You know, I mean, if you push this, you know, can I push it? Can I push your 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 logic here? If one has to validate one's logic and how they got there, do you do the same for the for the man who says, hey, it's OK for me to abuse my spouse? Now you say, OK, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. A exactly. So fundamentally. Fundamentally, your argument on uh, accepting one's logic falls on the face when it when you get to practical orthopraxy, as you say later. So, yeah, we want everyone to think like we think and believe like we believe that that we want there to be this false homogeneity within Christianity that we're all on the same page. I don't want it false. I want it true. And then when we encounter someone who is not, we can accept it. Not only do we not tolerate but we become somewhat oppressive and demeaning of a different perspective. Dr. Judy put it like this. Everyone runs to their own corners and then we start throwing bricks at one another. I find it ironic given I'm the one that wants to have the conversation um, and I was denied the conversation. So I find that ironic that you, you say this, but then you don't actually live like this because, like I said, at one point I was scheduled or it, it wasn't scheduled. It was uh, considered that I would uh, come and have this conversation face to face with uh, uh, Dr. Howard John Wesley. I think he think he's a doctor now. So I do want to show respect in that regards. Um, uh, I was scheduled. I was sorry, considered to uh, have the conversation and then it unfolded for whatever reason. Um, I was told my questions that I would send in 
I was told I could just send in my questions to him. And those questions were never even answered uh, publicly. And so that's why I say this will be best, best of best. And and, and, I, and I'm nice, man. You know, Howard, we, we will have a good conversation. <laughs> we could joke around, have lunch, uh, you know, off camera. I'm sure we would have a good conversation and, you know, it would be charitable. I, I, I think I'm a charitable person. I think the people who listen to me listen to me for that reason, that I give logical, coherent, biblical reasons, but I, I'm not insulting. I don't I don't participate in ad, ad hominem fallacies. And so I think that's why people do appreciate the work that I do. And I would uh, guarantee if we had this conversation, it would be one that you would, you know, even though we would disagree, you would say, wow, OK, he's a um, smart young fellow. <laughs> maybe not maybe not young to some people who, you know, that's subjective. But um you know, hey, he he's he's nice. He's not mean with his uh, critique. So hopefully you see that. And I think that's damaging to the witness of the body of Christ when we can't accept the logic of how someone got where they are. Listen, you may not believe what I believe. You may not think what I think. I may not believe what you believe. I may not think what you think. But at least let's validate the logic of how we got in our differing positions. And I think one of the most damaging, silent, repeated sins in the Christian church is not allowing there to be any room for the mystery of God. You know who some of the most dangerous Christians are? The ones who have God all figured out. The ones who have. Yeah, uh, you know. I can partially agree with this. Yeah, there are some people who think they know more about God than God himself, you know. So, yeah. So. But sometimes truths can be abused because then on the other end, there are some people who think you can't know anything about God, especially about the things he revealed. So th there is a balance when it comes to this subject that um, I don't think is being properly, uh, you know, communicated. So, yeah. PhD in God who believe that they've mastered God so much that they can judge others who don't think the same way they think God is a mystery God is bigger than our understanding what about the person see because that's that's why I'm saying this can, this is uh, you know abused because what about the person who says no God is not a mystery like they disagree with your logic I think there's some I, I would not use the term mystery I think there are some things that God hasn't revealed himself about um, and so we don't know or some things may be difficult and that we don't know. But I wouldn't say God is a mystery. There's many things about God I do know for certain. I know that God exists. I know that he cannot sin. Like I said, so even you, when you say God is a mystery, that has to be defined and worked out, uh, not just left on its own. Because like I said, it's it's not really clear on what you mean. I, I think I know what you mean. Um, so, but yeah. God is bigger than human comprehension. And if you really look at the ministry of Jesus, one of the issues Jesus continuously had with the Pharisees was that the Pharisees thought they had God in a box that God could not get out of. They knew God. They memorized the law. They quoted scripture. Nobody knew God like they did. And Jesus shows up to challenge the Pharisees' understanding of who and what God is. And every time we engage Jesus Christ, our mindset about God are to be enlarged and expanded. I'm not saying God isn't in the box you have. Well, just to get back on that Pharisee thing, a, a lot of times it wasn't that, I mean, they were wrong about some things, but a lot of things they were right about. That's why Jesus said, don't practice what they do. They, they were hypocrites. <laughs> they would say one thing and do another. And so they were right a lot of times, but their practice was wrong. And so, yeah. But God may be bigger than that. Let's so so he's like, you know, I'm not saying you're not right about the box you have him, but he may be bigger. But how would how would one know? Can we know? I, I, fundamentally, I don't think uh, Dr. Wesley can say yes to the question because he has bought into this idea of subjectivity, kind of this postmodern. Um, we can't be certain. And he's, he's really going to say that later. And it, it'll, it'll come out. That as Christians, we ought always be on the path of maturing 
and understanding more and questioning more and seeing God as bigger and allowing God to be mystery. That's what Job finds out when he engages God in the midst of his tragedy in Job 42. That's that place where we realize that God's bigger than Job's understanding. God Job, that, that wasn't why Job was rebuked, because he it wasn't like he thought he had God figured out. And, you know, he, uh, you know, God rebuked him. It was like, no, I'm mysterious. That's that, that wasn't the point of Job 42, one through seven. So <laughs> I don't see how he's using that as that. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, I'm trying to be fair in my critique. Uh, Dr. Wesley will use passages to support his point when that's not the point of the passage. And so he, 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 he does a lot of eisegesis. And we're going to see that here, right here. Shows up to Job and asks him questions that he can't answer. To remind Job, you'll never understand everything about God. No, the point was to, to humble Job. That was the point. Not, you know, well, you, you know, yeah, of course we won't know everything, but that, that doesn't mean we don't know some things. God's bigger than that. Beloved, that's what Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians. In chapter 4, this is what he says. Let us be stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Not the answers, but the mystery. Well, so this let me show you how this word mystery is actually being misused, biblically speaking, because, yeah, mystery to many of us is like the unknown, like, you know, but biblically, this word mis mis mystery, mysterion in the Greek is something that has been hidden, which is now revealed. That's why Paul says, let, let us be uh, stewards of the mystery of Christ. And he says, not the answers. Well, he, he misses the point, because how can you be a steward of something you don't know about? How can I be a, a steward, a, you know, someone that is held responsible uh, or how, how can I? Yeah. How can I be a steward, you know, a, a servant of Christ in that sense? Uh, if I actually don't know the very thing that is of Christ, you know, like I said, the term mystery, biblically speaking, is something that has been hidden, that was once hidden, that is now being revealed or ha has been revealed. And that is the gospel, you know, uh, in, in its full entirety, um, the person and work of Christ. You know, it was hidden. It was dull. It was dim. Now it's exploded with clarity and light. I mean, biblically speaking, that is the word, not in the sense that he's using it. Like we have no idea about this. Let me share with you a little bit about how this new series of doctrines that divide us began. Last weekend was World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday is that attempt within the entire body of Christ, regardless of what country, ethnicity, culture, color, whether you're a Christian in South Africa, a Christian in Australia, a Christian in Kenya, a Christian in the United States, that we all celebrate communion on the same day to symbolize our unity within the body of Christ. And I began thinking about that. The attempt to symbolize what unifies us as a body of Christ. And one of the reasons I believe that World Communion Sunday is so critical is simply this. Christianity, Christianity is arguably the most doctrinally divided world religion. Say that again. Christianity is arguably the most doctrinally divided world religion. I would I would argue that it is not. If you if you actually take uh, people who actually take serious the Bible, who believe in things like sola scriptura, the gospel, and you compare them to other religions, yo yeah, that's it's um. Now are there differences? Sure. But. Take someone like serious, like a Baptist as myself and a serious Presbyterians we will have 90, 95 percent agreement. We may agree, dis disagree on a couple things. Fundamentally, I would argue that we, we, most people wouldn't be able to see the difference between us. 
I would argue, as uh, Machen, uh, Machen did, liberalism, because it is a different uh, religion, fundamentally, I would hold that it is the most doctrine divided religion in the world. Um, you take you take a, two liberals and, and you can get completely different um, answers on things. You know, uh, there's other religions, you know, Mormonism is pretty doctrinally divided. I mean, especially to talk about historically, I would say, you know, Roman Catholic Catholicism. Um, Muslim, you take a Western Muslim and a, 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 a Eastern Muslim, you two different things. Now, obviously, there's going to be commonalities, but. This is just like, you know, uh, kind of like the Roman Catholic uh, card, you know, Christianity, you, you know, 100,000 denominations. And we've already gone over that and refuted that. What does it really mean to be a Christian? There's so many. different. Yes. What does it? And so you ask those people who take the Bible serious, you will get a fundamentally same answer or similar answer. Varieties and branches and practices of Christianity, that there really is not just one universal thing other than the belief that Jesus Christ is Lord who died and rose from the dead that makes us Christian. After that, Christianity goes in so many different directions more than any other world religion. More wow, I mean, so the I, so for him, the only thing I guess Christians disagree on is the belief that Jesus died and rose, but if you want to take his very simplistic understanding of what Christianity is, you have Christians who deny that or disagree on that. <laughs> like I said, you, you ever talk to a liberal Christian? They deny the resurrection of Christ. And so but I would argue there's a lot more that, um, you know, involves Christianity. Like notice the gospel is missing. In his answer, the, the deity of Christ. Um, all those things, you know, that are fundamental to the Christian Christian life, Christian living, even. So he, he this is this is the actual danger of mere Christianity. You reduce Christianity to one or two things, and this umbrella is so large that even unbelievers can fall into it. Clear unbelievers, you know, um, people who who deny his uh, her, or affirm heretical things. In, end up falling into the umbrella of mere Christianity. And Islam, more than Judaism, more than Hinduism, more than Buddhism, Christianity is so diverse. Here's the irony. Even in thinking about communion, how we celebrate, when we celebrate, what we eat, what we drink is so diverse that even that's not unified within the body of Christ. Christianity is doctrinally divided. Doctrine at its best should be a few things. Let's agree one, it should be biblical. That whatever we're saying, we believe about God and God. But he has no objective truth to even define what biblical is. Because I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. But if you start there, then everything else he says kind of falls on his face. If you admit that doctrine should be biblical and therefore Christianity and how we define it should be biblical. Then everything you just said before is it's kind of like, well, that's not true then. So, yeah. Relationship with us. Because we're Baptists and because we hold up Bible, we believe that those teachings of God ought to have some biblical reference. So <laughs> but then you would have to give up your inclusivism and you would have to give up truth being subjective and, you know, Bible contradictions and denying you know, or affirming now open theism that God doesn't know everything. If you saying our doctrine should be biblical, right? Dr. Wesley. We ought to be a little suspect of things said about God that we don't find in Genesis to revelation. Now, <laughs> amen. <to that. laughs> amen. Now, you know that that's a little problematic in itself. We've done a can I push it on Bible? Well, wait a minute. So he ends up just like, whoa, 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 you know. Yeah, it should be defined by the Bible. But, 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 but. You got to like caveat. Come on, man. And we know that they're varying understandings of what Bible is and what book should be in the Bible and how one interprets Bible. And I've, uh, 
I've done videos on those. So if, like I said, if you're encouraged, uh, interested, I would encourage you to watch it. But let's set as a foundation that if we believe it's true about God, that if it has something to do with God's relationship with us, that there ought to be some biblical basis. It should be biblical. Number two, it should be systematic. And what do we mean about syst being systematic? That, that what we say we believe about God over here should somehow fit what our theology is about God over here, that there's a system that they fit together. I, I can't say on one hand that I believe that God is love, and then on the other hand say that God hates certain people. Right? Well, I mean, I would just disagree with that right there because God can love and he also can hate because people are sinners. So your your systematic is actually, you know, so to be trying to be as kind as I can, it's actually confused because um, I be loving something and hating something aren't contradictions, right? If I love life, I'll hate death. So yes, God loves his people. He hates his enemies. So that's that's not a contradiction. That's that's a contradiction. And maybe in your worldview, because there are certain presuppositions you hold to that would allow those things to be contradictory, um, mainly probably your view view of God's love. So the question goes, well, does God have wrath? Does he hate sin? Does he hate sinners? I mean, you read texts like Psalm five, Psalm seven. You read even words Jesus said, you, you would come to the belief that absolutely. So it seems your systematic, sorry, but your systematic is above the biblical, which is very dangerous. That's not a system. Those, those pieces don't fit together. So when we say systematic, it's almost like taking a jigsaw puzzle of what we say about God and believing that the pieces are to somehow fit together. That, that what I believe about the Holy Spirit should systematically be connected to what I say I believe about the Bible, connected to what I believe about Jesus, connected to what I believe about the church, that, that, that I can't believe something about the church that is absolutely contradictory to what I believe about the Holy Spirit because they don't fit. So they have to be systematically connected. Doctrine ought to be biblical. It ought to be systematic. I agree in one sense. Your, your doctrine should be connected and Definitely what you say about God should flow over here to what you say about this subject. I, I do believe in uh, doctrine being connected. But as we see fundamentally with uh, Dr. Wesley, oftentimes is truths can be abused. Because, I mean, because like I said, you have to have the right doctrine of God or the right doctrine of love to understand or be connected fundamentally so that it won't contradict a right understanding of God's wrath. And so it's not just conjuring up your own systematic right? from your start. You said it had to be biblical. So, yes, you have to start off with that biblical understanding. Otherwise, you will um, abandon key doctrines in order to make your systematic fit. And that's actually the issue um, that I see often with many people. Um, they don't start off with a biblical pre premise. They start off with a worldly philosophical system. They start off with their systematic and we're all in danger to this. We all can do this. That's why we have to have the scriptures actually being the, the lens in which we see these doctrines or, or these doctrines are built upon. Otherwise, yeah, we'll we'll come up with all sorts of contradictory things, kind of like God not knowing everything like Dr. Howard Wesley believes. It ought to be relevant. It ought to have some bearing. Now, when he says relevant. I have a view of what I would mean by that. Like, yeah, your doctrine should impact how you uh, uh, live your life should be relevant to the culture. But I don't think that's what he means. We're going to see why. On our here and our now. The doctrine should not just be some belief about God that we have locked up in a closet, that we write in a book that no one's ever going to read, that has nothing to do with our daily living. But the truths I believe about God and God's relationship with humanity are to play themselves out in how I live my life. It ought to have something to do with how I see justice for LGBTQIA. So you see what he means. So it should be culturally relevant. 
So it should move along the time. This should be progressive. It should be, uh, you know, liberal <laughs> in its updated form. It should keep up with the culture, the, the times of, of, of the day it's speaking to, which I would fundamentally disagree. The Bible is what it is. So if that, in that sense, it's locked up in its uh, uh, origins, but not in its relevance. The Bible is always relevant to the culture, but the Bible doesn't change for the culture. The culture should change from the Bible. That's the issue. <laughs> he, sorry, I kind of paused him at a, uh, a bad spot because now he looks shocked at what I said. <laughs> sorry, doctor. It has something to do with what I believe the role of women is in the church. It ought to have something to do with my own prayer life. It yeah, because he believes uh, women can be pastors. So, like I said, the, the Bible being like an authoritative, objective thing is not, it's not, that's not where he's coming from. He's going to make that very clear in a moment. To be relevant daily, it ought to be practical. It has something to do, not just what I believe, but what I put into praxis, what I put into how we operate. What I, we believe about God ought to be practical to how we operate in our church. What I believe about God's relationship with us should have some bearing on how we practice baptism or the Lord's Supper. The doctrine undergirds it, and you're going to hear me say in a minute, that orthodoxy, right thinking, impacts orthopraxis. Absolutely. And, and let me say this. A lot of times, uh, Dr. Howard Wesley um, will say things that are true. You know, sometimes I'll be following along and I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. And then he'll take a, depending on where you're coming from, a left or a right turn, you know, um, well, I'm like, wow, how, how did you come to that conclusion, given the things you just said? I mean, it was it was following great. You know, you know, so um, I think a lot of those presuppositions, this is why I would love to fundamentally have a have a dialogue with him. I think we would have a great exchange. And that offer still stands to him. Um, if his secretary wants to give me a call, give me an email as as uh, once happened, um, we could have a great exchange. Right. Doing. We'll get there in a moment. And finally, I believe. The doctrine ought to be biblical, systematic, relevant, practical, but also liberating. Again, I think we're going to have a difference in what we mean, because I would say the same as well. But just listen to what he says. Howard John Wesley does not believe that doctrine about God should wind up in the oppression of other people. There's something wrong in my understanding of God if it then causes me to oppress other people. So any kind of like self-perceived oppression, well, if you're using the Bible to come to that, um, then you're wrong. So, so for example, um, women pastors, right? So a lot of women will say, hey, it's oppressive if you don't allow for women pastors Therefore, you're using the Bible for to not be liberating, you know. And so, I mean, you can do this with anything. People who are like pro uh, sexual, uh, you know, promiscuity. So you're using the Bible to really oppress me to be a sexual creature. God created us for sex. So it's like you're misusing this doctrine um, to oppress me. That's that's the that's the belief. Whereas I would say no. God is setting a limitation on the creature or in this position or this role and says, do not go further. And therefore, um, it's not you. It's not not the preacher or the Bible being liberating. It's actually you being lawless. <laughs> you know, you trying to be more you, you're trying to be antinomian. Um, so. So, yeah. I think we can agree that whatever doctrine of God slaveholders held that then justified the inhumanity and cruelties of slavery, something is wrong about that. This is why doctrine and theology is important because what you believe to be true or right about God will impact and affect what you do and how you live out your faith in relationship to God and relationship to others. Absolutely. Now, the very use of the word ortho 
right or correct is kind of subjective. So, he, you know, orthodoxy is subjective fundamentally for uh, Dr. Howard John Wesley. Um, I, I fundamentally disagree with that because now that kind of gets into the, the Bible. Do we have an objective uh, revelation word from God? Thus saith the Lord. So f fundamentally, given what he just said, he would have to argue, no, we don't. Therefore, to answer the question, who is God? Um, what is the church to be like? Um, who is Jesus Christ? Who, what is, what, who is the spirit? Um, what is the gospel? Those things are all subjective and you cannot come to any kind of, uh, you know, yes, this is what it is. You can, uh, you can't have an ultimate or objective doctrinal statement. So even defining doctrine, orthodoxy is subjective and you, you can't even define these things objectively speaking. And so, like I said, I fundamentally, fundamentally disagree with that. Like I said, I mean, this is why he comes to the doctrinal positions he do, because it's all subjective anyway. And I mean, just kind of playing around with doctrine and theology. Right or correct. According to whom? To God, to God's word. That's why you can have an a, a objective basis for the principles uh, and, and your beliefs, because, um, yeah, if, if, if this was all on the basis of us, uh, just humans. Yeah, I would I would. I would I would tend to agree with you, but that's not the position I'm coming from. I, I'm, I'm saying we have a authoritative uh, uh, theonostos word, a, a God breathed inspired word, uh, a God breathed message that um, we hold to. And so, yeah, we're not coming from the same place. What's orthodoxy for Catholic may not be orthodoxy for Baptists. And so what I want to do over. Yeah, but we can go to the scriptures and see which orthodoxy is biblically based. Right. Can, can we can we do that? Dr. John Howard Wesley, can we go to the Bible and see what the Bible says and, and, and just believe that? You know, that's that's because that's where I'm coming from. And it, and it seems like you will teach that from the pulpit. But fundamentally, you don't agree with the things you're teaching, because I listened to one message where. I was like, is this the same guy? Because he was preaching from the pulpit, a gospel, and it was a good gospel message. You know, but fundamentally in his Can I Push It series and his uh, doctorate um, and his studies. I would fundamentally say he, he would not agree with anything he just said. Like I said, because he denies those things, right? He, he doesn't have an objective basis to even stand on for those things, you know. So I would argue <laughs> you can't be different in your philosophy uh, or your studies or your doctorate than you are from the pulpit. You can't be contradictory. It's, it sends a confusing message to your people. I would I would argue as well. These next few weeks of Can I Push It is a few things. I want to walk historically through some of the divisions within the body of Christ. We're going to take a little walk down memory lane history, starting with the first church that we read about in Acts, how that becomes the Catholic Church. Then look at the first. I think that would be surprising to uh, <laughs> a lot of people living in uh, in that time period. And I've already listened to it. And let me tell you guys, the, the history is very sloppy. Um, I mean, just going through thousands of years in like five minutes. And so you guys let me know, should I should I do a do something on that. I think it could be a good teaching moment, but it'll be frustrating. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm thinking about do it, doing it. But you guys uh, drop in the comment, drop in the chat right now. If you would uh, like to hear a church history section based on um, a critique of Dr. John Howard Wesley or Howard John Wesley. So, yeah. Doctrinal division within Catholicism called the Great Schism. And that was not the first division. Um, that was not the first debate or disagreement. So, like I said, I'll, I'll be busy doing the critique. We'll then walk through history to get through the next big schism called the Protestant Reformation. And that was not the next. Dis <laughs> so you have two two disagreements in 1500 years. Like, wow. I mean, that th Wow. That's shocking that someone can read history and come to that conclusion. And like I said, 
I think I will do it because it'll be a good opportunity to present actual good uh, church history books that I have uh, back here um, and just give some people some good reading material to uh, understand kind of the historical basis for some of this stuff. From there, we're going to take a moment to then look within modernity at some of the doctrinal issues where we are divided. There's so many things that divide us in what we think to be true. Look at some of the things he has on the screen that he says, well, hey, you can still be a Christian. This is where he's coming from. You can still be a Christian and divide on these issues. Think about this for a second. So you can be a Christian and, um, you know, and some of these things I think he's right on. But I'll read the ones where I think he's obviously wrong on, which there's a lot. You could be a Christian and deny the Bible as being the source of revelation, heaven. So you can be a Christian and deny, <laughs> uh, have different views of salvation or the gospel being um, the second coming. You could deny the second coming, still be a Christian. What do you know? Um, the nature and character of God, uh, existence of evil, Satan himself, deny that, deny hell, deny sin, um, deny the deity and humanity of Christ. I mean, <laughs> wow. Uh, deny the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, and then other religions like, hey, are they in or out? All those things Christians can agree on, yet they're still in the body of Christ. They, like I said, fundamentally, the only thing you have to be, agree on, for, like what, what he said earlier is that Jesus died and rose. Wow. There's That's what I said, man. Mere Christianity is very dangerous. It is very dangerous to the body because... You give up every core fundamental belief of Christian Christianity to where you can actually no longer distinguish Christianity from certain pagan movements. Vision around the Bible. These are some of the divisive issues within Christianity. And what you think about these issues will then determine how we live out our faith. So we'll see how these issues play out and how and why we have communion. All right. So, I mean, I agree with that. Your doctrine does uh, impact your practice and it, it should at least. Um, so for one to just be dead, cold orthodoxy, that's not the point. Our doctrine should impact our hearts, which should impact how we live. So I agree with that. But, yo, what do you guys think? Dr. Howard John Wesley is back with Can I Push It? And so I want to continue providing a critique of what, of what I've been doing. Like I said, I, I know fundamentally this will make some people mad. I'm being divisive. I'm being I'm a hater. Uh, it's not why I do these things. I, I do these things because I believe the Bible. I fundamentally believe the Bible. I believe what the Bible says and um, on things like, you know, when Jesus says I am you will, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Fundamentally, Dr. Howard does not believe that. Um, I believe in the nature and the source of revelation being primary and fundamental. And I have reasons for that. I have great books. And if you guys would like me to recommend some sources on that. But <clears throat> fundamentally, like I said, mere Christianity is dangerous. Like I said, it, it really rips and roots what makes Christianity distinctive from other religions. Um, it, it makes it, it rips. For, so for Mormonism, I mean, you from his view, you really couldn't tell Mormonism and Christianity apart because the only thing he has different is or the only thing he views as primary is uh, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, which Mormons believe. So fundamentally, it's not much uh, difference between him and a Mormon, because that's the only thing that makes Christianity, I guess. So I guess Mormons are in, um, you know, so. <laughs> And then what kind of resurrection, bodily resurrection or spiritual? Because if that's the case, then Jehovah's Witness are in because they don't believe in a bodily resurrection. They believe some kind of spiritual resurrection. And so it's like all these kind of things you can you can go into and show, hey, they're, they're not actually re really distinctive enough to call it a, a religion separate from these things. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, I will continue my critique and series of um, Can I Push It? I think season three now. Um. And just provide a, uh, a, a, a reason why you as a Christian can can um, lay hold to the things you believe on, believe in and have historically been believed in. And, and you know, just believe the Bible. You'll be all right. So, guys, welcome. Thank you and welcome for listening to another episode of All Things Theology. Grace and peace until the next time. Everybody, everybody.